All right. Hey, everybody. So today we are in Gloucester. We're going to go over to the beach later to do our actual reading. But I wanted to introduce you over by the harbor because it's one of the oldest harbors in the United States. And today we're going to be reviewing a few different articles about machine learning algorithms and how you can really figure out what kinds of algorithms that are out there. This is really helpful for anybody that doesn't really know much about machine learning or is really confused with all the options that are out there. All right, so with that, let's go get started. So this will be a little bit different than my other reviews because this article isn't arguing anything. It's really a fantastic review of different machine learning types. And if you don't know much about machine learning yet, or you have a favorite algorithm, but you don't quite know the method to the madness behind the machine learning that you're working with, this is a great article to check out. By the way, that is linked down below if you want to follow along. All right, so the structure of this paper is it goes over the main types of machine learning first, and then it digs into some of the nuances of those different types. One thing to keep in mind when you're reading this is all of these different types can build off of each other. So a classification type can also be part of a hybrid model or something that is self-learning can also be part of a regression model. It's really how the data is coming in, how the machine is learning off of that data, and then what data is coming out of the machine afterwards. So keep that in mind as we go. There are three main areas that these types are categorized as. There's primary, which are the tried and true, everybody needs to know. Hybrid, which is building on those primary uh, types. And then the other common approaches, which again, is kind of an amalgamation and building upon the primary and hybrid types that we're going to go over. All right, so kicking it off, we've got classification and regression, two of the top types of machine learning. So classification is looking at the individual components of something and then trying to classify it. So that would be like a cat having whiskers and fur and it meows versus a dog that might bark. Then you've got regression and that's really looking at almost um, individual pieces of information that are true values like a price or an ISBN number or some kind of identification. Now these are both types of supervised learning. The data set that you are giving the machine in this example is known. You understand what it is and you're trying to teach the machine on that. But then you jump over to unsupervised learning. That's where you are giving unknown values, uh, basically a data set that you don't know what's in it, to the machine to learn from it and give you insight into what is in that data set. Oftentimes this is done with clustering. My favorite is k-means cluster, but there are plenty of other ways that you can cluster like-minded things together. So in this case, it might understand that cats and tigers are similar because they both have whiskers and tails and purr, uh, whereas dogs and wolves maybe are a little bit different because of the characteristics that they share. Then we have reinforced learning. So reinforced learning can sometimes be supervised or a hybrid where the information is given to the computer. So let's say how to win a chess game and you program what are those success criteria and the machine continuously tries to improve on its own learning to achieve that goal. That's essentially what reinforcement is, is rewarding the machine based on the information that you've given it that it got the right answer or it has won the scenario. Then there's semi-supervised learning. This is very popular, where essentially you are giving the machine a curated data set, right? So it's not totally random. And you're saying, okay, find the clusters that are like-minded. And then based on those clusters, we will identify that cats have tails, they meow, and they have whiskers. And those characteristics can then be used to identify cats in additional data sets. In that scenario, the machine figured out the different features that create and identify as cat, but then you are saying those features are called cat so that when the machine finds it somewhere else in another data set, it understands what label to assign. Then we have self-supervised learning. So this is more commonly known as neural networks or deep learning, and it's essentially giving the machine 
pre-trained models, but those models are not necessarily labeled and it self learns and based on semantic similarity. So it might find that cat and dog are very commonly associated with each other when people are talking about pets or pet food. And therefore, when it sees that relation between cats and all the different types of features of cats and dog and all the features of dogs, it'll say, well, wait a minute, I know these two things come together oftentimes when there is food for pets that are mentioned. So it gives that additional context. This is very popular nowadays. Now, this is where the article is a little confusing, where I kind of wish that there was a, a table that kind of showed how all of these different learning types intermix because self-taught learning is yet another type that is similar to the neural networks that we just described. The difference though is this self-taught learning is focused on learnings from different data sets and then using transfer learning, which we will talk about a little bit later, to basically take those learnings and then apply it to other distributed use cases or models that you already have. BERT is a good example of this because it was pre-trained, it's a pre-trained model on data that you don't really know about. And you can take that learning and use BERT on your own use cases. That's another point that I think would improve this article is once in a while, uh, they do mention what kind of algorithms or specific algorithms that support or are examples of these learning types. But I think just having one primary example for each of these would be incredibly helpful for people to take this approach of learning the terminology and the methodology and then trying to apply it. So if anybody is interested in me doing a video where I walk through exact examples of algorithms that fall into these categories, please like this video and leave a comment down below. Okay, so now we're into the fourth category in the article, which is common approaches. This is sort of a catch-all that, again, builds on some of those primary learning types, as well as the hybrid types that we've just reviewed. So the first one here is multitask learning. So that's essentially when a model is learning through multiple tasks. So it's looking at maybe an image and trying to identify what um, shapes are in that image, what colors are in that image. Um, are there people or animals in that image? Kind of breaking it apart into different learning tasks to achieve an ultimate goal of maybe full metadata for that image. The next I think is a little bit on the niche side and that's active learning. And I would say that I've used this the most when trying to create training sets for machine learning where I give an entire corpus of, of data to the machine and it tries to cluster them and then apply labels to those clusters um, in a semi-supervised learning approach. And those are the data sets that we then turn around and train the machine on to a higher degree of accuracy so that we can release it into production. And with that one, there's definitely a human in the loop element where having people look at the labels and those training sets beforehand to make sure that they are going to be more accurate is usually a good idea. The next is, again, gaining a lot of popularity because, you know, Twitter feeds and LinkedIn feeds and, you know, Google feeds and all kinds of feeds are now available where you can do online learning. And these really fall into two areas where there's incremental learning, where it's a one-time learning, and then there's sequential learning. And that would be, you know, looking at the sequence of events. And this might be, again, behavioral, but more looking for maybe click-through analytics or something where you have to see each step of the process from an overall data set. Now we're back to transfer learning. So I'm not going to go over this too much because we've already described that to some extent. But one drawback that the article does mention is that you still have to label your data. I mean, it, it helps with the actual learning and making sure you have enough data to learn from because that model was pre-trained essentially, like BERT. Uh, but you still have to, to know what's in your data to be able to use that learning. So 
It's still very much a sound way of training your machine. It's just going to require extra effort. It's not a one and done kind of thing. All right, so federated learning. This one is really important for any kind of sensitive data or data that you have to be very aware of security. Um, and that involves like medical or insurance or finance or anything like that. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking the individual data sets and it's scrubbing it to make it anonymous so that when you get it to the main place you're doing your analytics, you're not compromising anyone's security. Okay, next up is ensemble learning. I actually use this a lot when doing classification tasks where if I have a very, very large taxonomy, Sometimes you have to break that taxonomy into the different branches or disciplines so that you can train each model on those branches or disciplines on their own. And then after you have all of those models, you kind of assemble them at the end. So when you're doing your machine learning, let's take you have a medical model and a legal model. When the classification is happening, it will go through and find all the medical terminology that it's going to potentially assign. Then it's going to look at all of the legal terminology that it might assign. And then the last piece of the model is going to look at that as a whole, all the medical and legal together, and select what really is going to be assigned at the end. So this one is also tied into security, um, and that is adversarial learning and that's essentially making sure that the machine can identify fake and phony data so i actually know a lot of people that try to create fake and phony training sets um, to just do machine learning try to avoid that at all costs try to get real data even if they're pre-trained models that aren't 100 percent your discipline or your use case because when you make up data to train your model it does tend to overfit your model and it's not true to life. And so it's not going to perform very well in real life. So um, on the other side of the coin is if you want to teach your machine what to watch out for, train it on fake data uh, periodically, not the entire model, so that it can understand, oh, this is fake, this is not. Then we have metric learning. And this is similar to the ensemble type of learning. Except in this situation, it's learning from each task um, sequentially. So with ensemble learning, you can have, um, let's say, four different models, and it only finds something from three models that it's going to use and suggest. With metric learning, it's learning from every model that you give it, and then it's giving you a prediction or a suggestion at the end. So the difference here is, the first, which is ensemble, is really um, choosing which model to use, uh, whereas this metric learning is using every model that you have to come up with that prediction. So it's a step process versus a selection process. Then we've got targeted learning. And this one is something that you're going to really have to work with your business partners on because it's taking the model and understanding what in the model is the most at risk or the most important so that if you fall below a certain F score, link above if you don't know what F score is, um, to accept the predictions, the part of the model that um, was creating that suggestion would go back and try to find something that's going to fit better for the criteria that you have defined. So again, this is another subtype of all the other types that we've learned. Then we've got concept learning, and this is very common in Knowledge Graph, where you have a concept. That concept can contain um, what a cat looks like, what a cat sounds like, different um, types of cats, different languages, and what they mean when they say cat. Um, it can have a lot of different definitions for cat. It's, it's a container, so to speak, of all of that goodness of data that comprises what is a cat. And so that sets up a hypothesis when you are using that data to train a machine because then the machine is saying, okay, I know what a cat is. My hypothesis is this thing I've identified in the data um, that is not tagged yet looks and sounds and feels like a cat. Let me check to see if that's accurate based on the concept data that I have. And if the machine is not satisfied based on the criteria that you have given it, it goes back to the drawing board and tries to find the next best 
fit. And that's really up to you on what next best fit is going to be. Dovetailing into that, you have Bayesian learning, which is very, very common in machine learning because it's essentially looking at the statistical evidence to understand what is the probability of something being accurate or actually happening. So a lot of event series data is looking at how probable is an event to occur or if this threat is probably an actual threat or is it a false positive. Um, this is something that is used basically in all the machine learning types we've seen. In contrast, you have inductive learning. So there is the difference between logical and statistical reasoning. Usually you start with logical and then you move into statistical where you might use Bayesian models. Um, so logical is looking at the general rule to understand does this happen in general based on the rules that the machine knows. Whereas looking at the statistical reasoning, it then starts to break down that general rule and ask, but what is the probability that that actually happens? This is very common with small data sets where it's not necessarily the goal to find the statistical probability of an event, but really to understand if that event is true in a general sense or not. This next is very common with image or video data. And it's similar to the multitask learning type, but here it's distinctly looking at, let's say for a video, the image model, and it's going to use that image model to identify what is in that image. Audio model is going to be looking at what is actually said in the video. And then maybe language model is looking at what language is being spoken at the time. Now, I already mentioned that deep learning is something that probably falls into a few categories that we've already mentioned, but if you are interested in a whole video on deep learning, I'm going to link it up above. And the very last is a curriculum learning. So think about when you are creating a curriculum or you had to learn a curriculum in school. They start you out with something small and simplistic and then you work your way up into more complex understanding. That's what you can also do with machine learning where maybe you train the machine to understand what a mammal is then you help the machine understand what a cat is. And then you understand maybe what Garfield is, a very specific kind of cat. This is a way of training on something that's very complex or very easily misunderstood by a machine so that each step of the process is a model on its own. So that if something goes wrong in one of those models, you can quickly update it so the other models don't suck. All right, so that is my review for today. And I hope that you can put some of this into practice. I hope that you can get out there and have some fun just like I am today. 